Hello and welcome to another edition of WaveLab Workflows. My name is Justin Perkins. Today we're going to be talking about sort of a nerdy topic, but managing plugins in WaveLab, not necessarily using them and making things sound cool, but just I've been getting a lot of questions about how to manage plugins and plugin scanning and plugin um, preferences, favorites, plugin chains. Um, some plugin rendering issues, all sorts of kind of um, less fun but very important uh, ma uh, plugin related questions. So we're going to go through all sorts of stuff, including also some automation. Um, I've I've done a whole episode on plugin automation, but we'll touch on it again. Uh, but basically, going to go through all things plugin settings related. Now, you may notice that my mic sounds a little different today. I'm doing this from a office setup. Well, my main studio gets some new flooring put in, so apologies if it sounds different. Please let me know if there's any audio issues, because i got a slightly different setup going today than usual, but everything seems to be working. So thanks for tuning in. Um, I just gave an overview of what we're going to be going through. If you have any follow-up questions, of course, head over to wavelabhelp.com, because in case I forget to mention it, I do have two plug-in rendering test montages. You're looking at one of them right now, which is just a one kilohertz tone. And I have another one that has pink noise and they're the same idea. It's just sometimes issues are easier to spot with pink noise and sometimes issues are easier to spot with a one K tone. They're both available to download at wave lab help. I just recently added them to the download section. And as you see me using it, you may realize that it could help you um, spot some plugin rendering issues or performance issues or things like that. So those are available to download now. You can head over to wavelabhelp.com for those. You can rewatch any videos. Hello to everybody saying hello. Um, and of course you can download my settings and preferences and things like that to help you get started with WaveLab. A little better starting point than it comes out of the box. So. Without further ado, let's see, everything looks good. Um, basically, I just wanted to, again, show you some of the behind the scenes stuff with plugins. Some of the stuff we're usually too busy working to really dive into. And when I touch on them in my other live streams, I'm usually too busy focusing on another topic to really dive into them. So I thought it'd be good to just go um, kind of from the start and um, talk about plugins. So. WaveLab, of course, uses VST2 and VST3 plugins. It does not use audio units or AAX or anything else. It's just VST. And I, sh I should have said VST3 first. Um, VST2 um, has been considered end of life. It's no longer being really supported by future versions of Steinberg products. For example, if you're a Mac user, using WaveLab 11.2 and you're on a Apple Silicone M1 or M2 Mac, you cannot use VST2 plugins. You can only use VST3 unless you open WaveLab in Rosetta mode, which I'll show you in a little bit. But basically you click on the icon for WaveLab and press Command I and you can open WaveLab using Rosetta mode. You have to, of course, close it and reopen it. Rosetta mode will allow you to use VST2 plugins, but of course that comes with a compromise of um, performance because you're not using the full Apple um, Apple Silicone processing chips. Um, hello, Matthias, and and again I'm using a different setup here, so if anyone has any if there's any audio issues, please let me know. Um, but basically, I wanted to point out that WaveLab uses VST3 plugins. I have heard of people using wrappers and things like Meta Plugin, which allows you to host. Um, it's a VST3 plugin that allows you to host other, insert other plugins inside of it. I've, I've not tried that myself. I've just heard of people using that. For me, that just adds a whole other layer of possible things to go wrong. So I prefer to not use that. Um, but this is the plugins menu and the preferences. I like to go to. I like to just press command in the left, um, kind of left triangle, or sorry, left left arrow thing, but basically you go to file, preferences, um, and there's a plugin section, and there's two tabs. We'll go through general and organize. General, we're looking at it right now. Um, 
oh, for various reasons, these plugins that I have installed, I've told to to not load. Typically, there's stuff that is not uh, useful in WaveLab or not supported. I don't even recognize some of these names or where they came from, but it does show you that. Um, you, you can specify different VST folders, although I tend to just install everything in the default folder where things uh, like to be. I think this is more for Windows users where you can really customize where things are installed a little better. Um, one thing I want to focus on here is um, sometimes people will say, I install the plugin, but it's not showing up in WaveLab. Um, a few things to check. Uh, the first one is you can always force a plugin scan on the next launch. So you could press this button, quit WaveLab, and reopen it. Now, those of you, you may know that plugin scanning can take quite a while. If you have a lot of plugins, it could be 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes sometimes. And you can't always just walk away because sometimes it will get hung up and say, do you want to ignore or um, keep waiting for this plugin to, to load and you have to hit one or the other. So you can't, you got to keep an eye on it. Um, when you, when you do a rescan, um, now I have found in, in the transition of plugins becoming M1 and M2 compatible, I have found cases. It happened to me with, with soothe two, uh, back when that trend just transition occurred. Um, when I installed the new version of soothe two, that was M1 supported. Even though I had been using it before, it was no longer showing up in WaveLab. I did the rescans like you see here. It was just not showing up. And I found that what I had to do is go into my WaveLab preferences folder, into the cache, and you're going to see two plugin registry files. Um, the one that has ARM in it, that's for Apple Silicone mode, which I'm in right now. And the other one that doesn't have that is for Rosetta mode, or if you're just on an Intel Mac, um, it's just going to be this one. And again, I apologize that I don't, I don't know how it looks for Windows users, but it's probably just this file that I have highlighted. And what I found that is instead of forcing a rescan, just deleting that file with WaveLab closed and reopening it, it's almost more of like a hard reset or a hard rescan where it you're literally deleting the file that um, tells WaveLab what plugins are there. And for whatever reason, when plugins started going M1 and M2 native, deleting that file worked better for me than the, the force rescan. I don't, I don't know why that is, but if anyone's really stuck getting a plugin to show up in WaveLab and they're trying the force, res, force uh, plugin detection, the rescan, try just actually deleting that file and, and reopening WaveLab and you'll find that probably it will show up. So to keep going down the line here, there is a somewhat new feature, and I'll turn on the the hint so it can you can read um, what it says as well. But this is a somewhat new feature that people requested because again, those plugin scans can take a long time, and if it's just a minor maintenance update, there's really no need to rescan it because it has the same name. It's going to load the the latest version of the plugin, of course. So. Um, if you if you're a little bit impatient and you have plugins that update a lot, maybe you do beta testing, you can um, actually activate that box and you might see some faster plugin scanning. But as it says, um, if there's some more involved updates to a plugin, uh, WaveLab may not see that. So it's kind of a use at your own risk setting, but just be aware that it's there. Um, there is an option for faster graphics refreshing, but it uses more power. So if, if you have a older computer, you may want to turn that option off. And this last setting is for WaveLab's uh, Supervision plugin, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll open it up here. This is a metering plugin that allows you to customize it just how you want. You can add all sorts of different... Um, modules you can really make this bigger and have even more um, different types of meters you can load up all these things and customize them and move them around to how you want it you know to be arranged uh, but my whole point was there's a special setting for multi-core processing of the supervision plugin just because it's a little more cpu intense that way it'll keep up graphics wise um, i've actually never changed this but you can change the uh the mode of, of certain types of knobs uh, in WaveLab. 
but that kind of does it. This is this section's pretty basic, um, but I just wanted to start here because it's the general tab. But this is sort of where you um, get started with plugin preferences as far as rescanning. And again, that hard rescan is in this path if you want to just actually delete these files. Um, again, the, the ARM version is for Apple Silicon mode. And if you're not sure, you can always go to WaveLab about WaveLab, and it tells me that I'm running in Apple Silicon mode. If I were to close WaveLab and choose Rosetta mode, then uh, of course it would say Rosetta here. So that's that for that section. This section gets a little more involved. Um, and before I forget, um, those of you that use UAD plugins, um, their classic UAD um, two plugins, which I actually have, uh, I'm using an arrow for my interface to do these live streams, so I do have access to this. But all these classic plugins, these are UAD2, sorry, yeah, they're UAD2, but they're also VST2 only. So you're going to see that because I'm in silicone mode, they don't show up in WaveLab. And only their newer uh, UA Spark plugins, you know, they're, they're slowly making everything native. So in my opinion, they haven't really gotten to the good ones yet for mastering but we're starting to see under the ua spark they call it ua dx um, we're starting to see vst3 versions appear and you, you can tell i, I can't show you because i'm in silicone mode but um, the vst3 plugins they have these three lines sort of like the backwards adidas logo that means it's a vst3 plugin if i were in rosetta mode i could show you that Plugins that don't have those three stripes, those are VST2 plugins, and then again, VST3 has the, the three stripes. So that's how you differentiate, and that's again why you're only seeing the three stripes, as I'm in uh, silicone mode. But I just wanted to point out, because this comes up a lot of people wondering, where are my UAD plugins um, in WaveLab? And the reason is, for whatever reason, Universal Audio is not really, uh, they're being fairly slow to create VST3 versions. As you can see, pretty much every major plugin developer has done VST3 and have for a long time. So I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention because it's a very common question of, you know, why can't I use, why aren't my UAD, people will rescan and rescan and rescan and it's just, it's never gonna show up unless you open in Rosetta mode and, and use that sort of compromised, uh, it's still pretty good, but you know, you're know you not using the full advantages of Apple Silicone. So when you get to this um, screen, there's a whole lot more going on. I should start over on the right. I like to sort my plugins by vendor because I when I think of plugins, I think I want to use this plugin by this company. I, I'm just used to seeing plugins sorted by vendor, but you can sort it a few different ways. You can sort it by category, can sort it by category then vendor or, or the opposite you can sort it by vendor and then sort it by vendor followed by the category I, I don't like to have the two tier you know that for me that's too much to look through I just like to have have the uh, the company name first that because that's just what comes to mind when I think of a plugin I want to use um, and there's a little bit of um, stuff to help you sort them out with the the hierarchy and and how many you see um, and things like that. Because if, if you have, you know, Waves plugins, they have so many that it, that it can get a little overwhelming. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other settings here that you're going to have to sort out to your liking of, of how big your screen is and how many plugins you use. Um, now, down, down here in the bottom right, there is a little thing to show ignored plugins. There's a few plugins for me that just, um, when, they, when it scans for them, it does they don't ever they don't want to load like Melodyne, but I really don't care about Melodyne um, in Wave Lab, so I've never really um, looked into it. So, but that'll show you, show you your list of ignored plugins, which again, if you do a rescan or delete that registry file, it'll start over. And I've actually never really had to use this, but this, you can see how many plugins that you have, which is like, interesting. So over here on the right is again, where you kind of decide how it's sorted. And let me go to uh, that everyone knows Fab Filter. Um, 
when you click on this arrow, you get to see all the plugins from each vendor. And it'll tell you the precision in which they can process audio. And I should back up here. I didn't plan on showing this, but so I don't remember exactly where it is, but it's probably in the audio montages. Uh, maybe it's just in global audio. Yeah, precision. So you can decide if WaveLab is is processing plugins at 32 or 64 bit float. Although as you saw here, some of them are just natively uh, limited to 32 bit float. It's nothing to lose sleep over, but you'll notice that other plugins um, like SunX and Tokyo Dawn probably, you know, 64 bit float. Just a little higher precision, but again, nothing to lose sleep over. But the main thing I wanted to show you here is you get a few options here. Um, and I used to do this. I don't do this anymore because I don't, in silicone mode, there are no VST2 versions loading. But I used to actually go through and uncheck all the VST2 versions because I didn't even want to see them. You know, like if I was working and I look at my plugins, you know, you would see the VST3 and the VST2 of each plugin. And it just got to be too much to look at. So, um, I decided I used to uncheck those. Now I don't have to do that with, with wave lab, uh, 11.2 in, in Apple Silicon mode, cause they just simply don't load. But this does, if there's any plugins you want to hide, you can uncheck the effect box and they just won't show up in your plugin list. You know, when you're working in the montage or the master section, they just, it's kind of like trying, you can hide them. Um, and these checkboxes go to the right. Final means final effects. And that's more related to the master section, which I usually keep hidden, as most people know that watch these. Uh, the master section is not tied to any particular montage or file. You have to really be careful that you load and save it and things like that. Um, so I don't use it, but the final button would allow this plug in to be inserted in the final effects. So you'll notice if I go there, Pro Q3 is the only one that shows up because that's the only fab filter that I have allowed here. And the final effects dithering section is just that. It's for if you're resampling from say 96 to 441, you typically want to add some kind of true peak limiter after that to prevent or you know to manage the peaks that occur from sample rate conversion. And then uh do your dithering after that, because then it's the very last thing in the processing chain. Um, again, I don't use this, but that's what the final does. Play is another thing. I'll show you. Um, this question comes up a lot too. People, you know, WaveLab has these playback processing slots in the master section, and those are actually really handy for additional metering plugins and room and headphone correction plugins, such as Sonarworks. Um, can opener, things that people use to correct their headphones. Um, can't see the full screen. Let's see why that is. Sorry about that. Um, I may just have to move the master section over. I think I'm just gonna have to move the master section over for, for today's purposes. I'm using a different size screen and that may be throwing things off, but I think we can get through it. Um, so anyways, the playback processing section is good for um, things that you wanna hear and see, but not be part of your rendering um, chain. You know, back when Sonarworks first came out, people would use it and then they would accidentally have it enabled when they're bouncing their files and then you have this strange eq on your audio um and thanks thanks jason for pointing out the uh i'm using a different size screen so i i i, I thought uh ob i thought the streaming software would adapt to that but it clearly did not and i didn't catch it um but i think it'll be okay for what we need to do today anyways playback processing is really cool one of my favorite parts of wave lab because i can host metering plugins here and you could also host, you know, room correction, headphone correction. You don't have to worry about that audio ever being rendered. And also it doesn't influence your, the metering of WaveLab. So let's say 
You know, I remember sonar works. I don't use it, but it had to turn the level way down in order to make room for the EQ corrections, which would, of course, throw off all your metering in a lot of cases. But um, with with the playback processing, it uh, bypassed. You know, the playback processing step doesn't affect the metering. So, but my my whole point was, I get a lot of questions of people wondering why they can't insert this plugin or that plugin in their playback processing slots, and it's because you have to go in and um, actually press the play button. So I've done that, as you can see, for uh, my Clarity M. I have the play button checked. Um, the Dyne, so I think that's all I need to say about that, is that the play column is to make whatever plugin you want appear in the playback processing slots. Because uh, by default, by default, there's some Steinberg ones, like the encoder checker, and supervision, of course, but you know, I had to add some of these myself. I like the Doro meters by waves. Um, so that's where you enable plugins to be visible in playback processing. The next section is Dyne, which stands for dynamic, and you can see the description there. Um, basically, kind of designed again for UAD plugins because um, you know, if you have a montage and you have a bunch of clips which are songs it would be very easy to max out your uad processing um, if you had let's say 12 songs um, the dyne option was designed so that it's the plug-in processing is only taxing your cpu when that particular song is playing or rendering so the the goal was to make it you know dynamic in the sense that it's not always taxing the cpu just when it's needed and again, you'll notice, well, actually, I can't even show you because I'm in silicone mode, but if you have an older computer, you'll probably notice that by default, all the UAD2 plugins, the Dyn option is checked. Um, the Dyn option is checked by default. It's mainly designed for UAD, and it could work for other plugins, but that's what that is. The Gen thing, that's for generic GUI. I'll check that for um, the Fab Filter. Why don't I check it for the EQ because I know that plugin a little better. And we'll see what happens. But in theory, what's supposed to happen is instead of the normal GUI, you just get these gray sliders. And we'll see if that happens. What happened last time? Siri thinks I'm talking to her. Um, I've had it happen where I wish I could show you this. It's somehow not, um, maybe to, but basically the gen mode shows you generic sliders instead of the fancy GUI. And of course on live streaming, it's not cooperating, but I've had people say, why does this plugin not have the GUI? Why is it just, um, these gray sliders and that, I've seen it happen where sometimes, occasionally, the uh, the gen button gets stuck or gets turned on for some reason for a certain plugin. So if we go to, let me try one other plugin and just see if I can get it to work to demonstrate it. There it is. I don't know why the EQ isn't doing it, but this would normally be the Fab Filter compressor but instead of seeing the GUI you get this generic thing which has all the options that you would want to control but it's you could argue that it's hard to look at or you maybe you like it better because it's less distracting but if you ever have a situation where a plugin is showing up like this like this this list of generic stuff then uh, that would be why because again for reasons I can't tell you, I've had it happen. Somebody asked me this question, and somehow the gen box gets ticked. Um, and this out section, I'd actually never use it, but it's apparently to specify the channel layout. If you're doing multi, you know, surround stuff in the master section. And then lastly, um, favorites. So you can favorite plugins so that when you are working like in the montage, you get this favorites list. 
And that's kind of a nice little way to just have your favorite stuff show up a little easier. There's, of course, a recently used list, and there's a, there's a search button, so you could search for, I'm sure I've used Gold Clip. That's a good one. So you can search as well, but the little favorites thing is nice. Um, I've actually never played around with shortcuts. Um, I guess I've never played around with it because it opens them in the master section, which I, I don't uh, I don't use really. So that's sort of the main thing I wanted to show in this in this area is just um, how to make sure you're seeing the plugins that you want to see and in which spots and and why that sometimes it might show up as a generic thing and i think a lot of people don't know about the dynamic mode for uad plugins so if you are UA, if you're still using uad2 plugins on an older machine um, it's probably already checked but make sure that the dynamic mode is checked dynamic mode is checked because it might help you um, not eat up all the cpu on your uh, uad card and things like that so um, if anyone has any questions, of course, free feel to at, feel free to ask. I'm just going to scan my my notes here and make sure I didn't skip anything before we move ahead and grab a sip of water. Because now I want to move into some of the more uh, performance based things. You know, when you're actually using the plugins, so. Let's get to that because I get, you know, a lot of the questions on the forums. And I apologize, you're not going to see the whole montage screen, but I think, again, for what I'm doing today, it's going to be okay. Um, otherwise, I would stop and figure it out. A lot of questions and comments you see with related to plugins is, you know, this third party plugin is having an issue. It's fine on playback, but it's not rendering correctly. Um, sometimes you don't notice those things till after you've rendered it. And if it's really unfortunate, you don't, uh, your client hears it first cause you didn't check the file, um, before you render it or after you render it before you send it out. So, um, whenever I want to introduce a new plugin into my workflow, I have a pretty strict test that I, uh, I do, you know, aside from making sure I like how it sounds, I do a kind of a rendering test. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, I have two test montages. One is uh, 1K tone and one is pink noise. They're the same concept. It's just at some point I decided to make both because um, it's easier to catch certain issues with, with 1K tone versus a full spectrum of pink noise. Um, so one thing that's going to kind of be at the heart of what I'm going to talk about is if you go to audio montages, there's a couple additional, um, plugin related preferences that are not in the plugins section. So if you go to audio montages and active audio montage, um, there's this setting here and I'll just highlight it for anyone that wants to read it as well. But basically, this button will reset the plugins before rendering, which basically happens anyway, because one thing that makes WaveLab unique from, say, Pro Tools or Cubase is when you go to render your files after you've dialed things in, it actually makes a copy of what you had going on and it kind of renders it in the background. That's why you're still able to... When you hit render, you're able, with the exception of a DDP, when you hit render, you're still able to do edits and move stuff. Whereas, you know, in Pro Tools, which is some, I don't know Cubase to be honest with you, but in Pro Tools, whether you're doing an offline or online bounce, when you do that, the screen is kind of locked. You can't start, you can't touch anything within the session. And WaveLab, like I said, is different. It makes sort of a copy and renders in the background. You can keep doing stuff. Um, this is where a lot of plugin manufacturers don't test their plugins to make sure that they can, it can handle that. But be aware of this setting. I like to keep it on because that way you always know um, that the plugin has been reset before rendering. Because I've had cases where turning this off, 
there's an intermittent issue because if you if you have just played the plugin and then you go render it, it could be fine. If you just open the montage and don't play anything and render it, it could be a, a rendering issue. So I like to have reset on because then I know that every time I render a file, the plugins have been reset before rendering. They're starting from scratch as, as far and it's not resetting the settings. It's resetting things like latency and um you know, it's just resetting the buffers and latency and things like that. Um, it's not resetting all your settings to a default state. Um, so I like to have this turned on. I just want people to be aware of it because it's going to tie into my next um, thing here. You know, I've, this is an audio montage. For those that don't know, Wave, WaveLab has clip, track, and montage output slots for your effects. Now, clip... A clip is basically each song. You can split songs up into more than one clip, but to keep it simple, a clip is a song. Track, people might confuse the track effects. We're not talking about CD tracks or album tracks. We're talking about um, audio tracks within the montage. And In my case, I only have one track that has two lanes. Um, and I, In the case of singles, I've actually been using tracks more, you know, this is kind of, I haven't done anything yet, but this is kind of like a single song, how it might look if I was doing a in the box master. And of course on the output section, I might have my um, maximizing and limiting, but instead of putting the um, other plugins like EQ, saturation, compression, instead of putting that on the clip, like I might in an album session, I've been using the track section because with singles, this is my preference. With singles, I like to, you know, I might want to send a section of this to R Isotope RX to do an external edit to clean up a click or pop, or I might have, I might have the main version followed by the instrumental followed by the clean version. And if I use track effects, I only have to manage um, one set of plugins. Um, let me just insert something. I only have to manage one set of plugins for all the versions. You know, this could be like my main EQ. Um, whereas if I was using clip effects, doing a single that have multiple versions, if you update, you know, the EQ on the main version, then you have to remember to go back and update it on all the alternates. So track effects are kind of handy for um, doing singles, in my opinion, because then uh, it doesn't work so well for albums because track effects are going to affect all the songs equally just like the output would so with albums and eps i'm using clip effects for the per song settings output effects for the main like final limiter and then if there's instrumentals that becomes a whole separate montage after it's approved getting a little off track but um the whole point was there's basically three spots plus the master section that i don't use but um as far as automation, I'll show that last, but automation is only available on the clip effects. There is no line for the track itself or for the montage output. There's no lane to dial in automation or manage it. So the only way to automate, automate uh, plugin parameters is on the clip effects themselves. And again, I've done a whole, a whole video about that. Um, but I did want to show what I was talking about with, with, uh, Potential plugin issues. Now I'll just insert a simple EQ um, and just do a little change here. It's a, uh, it's a 1K tone, so maybe it would make sense to change that area. And that again, that is just applied on on song number two. Now I'm not trying to show. Um, Bring attention to this plugin developer he, he's aware of the issue but um, there was a new plugin called gold clip that came out and he again he's fixing it he's aware of it um, but i just want to show you what, what can happen with a lot of different plugins um, you know i've got that on the clip four uh, when i go to render this let's watch what happens i just have a little i'll just render to the desktop to keep it simple for now this happens with so many plugins. I've had it happen with DMG, Sonics. Um, the plugin developers are, are able to fix it if you tell them about it, but you'll notice that um, I should point out that this, this test tone, 
this test montage, it's a 1K tone. If I were to play this through, you can watch kind of on my spectrometer that when it changes from song one to two, well, um, there was a little hiccup there because I have a plug in on there, but let's go from five to six. It should be totally smooth. Yeah, so when it changes from five to six, there's no disruption. And that's why this is a good test montage is because it's kind of simulating seamless or gapless um, albums. You know, some of these issues are not noticeable when there's true silence between the songs, like most albums are. But um, And I've also done a whole gapless rendering um, live stream if you want to learn a great way to do gapless albums. But my whole point was this is a gapless test tone broken up into tracks. So when we play it back... You know, you can see that track two is louder because I was boosting that EQ, but you can see that the um, the level boost happens right away, right when track two starts. Now let's go to track four. It's got this, it's usually about 40 seconds ramp up, or sorry, 40 milliseconds. I don't want to scare anyone. Uh, 40 milliseconds, for whatever reason, this plugin ramps up the audio for 40 milliseconds, and it's only kind of evident because the clips are... Tr trim so tightly um, so this is a case where you report it to the plugin developer you say hey I've been working in WaveLab with your plugin um, there's a slight issue at the start of the render you know can you fix that I've had people fix it um, the new Sontech um, where is it this great new EQ um, had that issue they fixed it in 24 hours and I was up and running um, with a, with a fixed version. So most plugin developers, if, if you tell them about it, they can fix it. Um, but my whole point was when I'm going to introduce a new plugin, like, like the, uh, the Sontech or gold clip, I, um, I, r I run them through a test to make sure that what I'm hearing is what I actually get on rendering because that's not always the case. And if you are running into trouble, if you have the ability to try the VST two version, it's worth a try. Um, the other option is to uncheck this box and try some scenarios to see if you can get it to render correctly. But I always suggest checking your renders so that I just wanted you to be aware of that reset plugins before rendering because it's a, it's a setting that is not easy to find um, or be aware of or know what it does. But I, I, again, I keep it on because then you always know what state the plugin was rendered from when you render and. Just as a reminder, if this was an album, you know, I rendered the whole montage as one file first because that also helps mitigate issues. Some plugins have a hard time with hard starts. Um, and then some plugins still have a hard time when I do the whole montage and give it a heads up. So um, getting a little off track. I got a whole live stream on rendering as well. But I just wanted to, again, point out that setting of resetting because it, um, it can help you find issues. It can help you avoid issues if you uncheck it. But again, be aware of what your plugins are doing because um, especially if you have an album that should be gapless, um, what you hear on playback is not always going to be what you get when you're rendering. Um, let's get into some more fun parts of this. Um, I sort of showed you with... with uh, the single, but I'll go backwards. You can, there's this menu is pretty powerful in my opinion. You can remove now the selection is kind of subtle in my opinion, but right now only the first plugin is selected. It's got this very faint white um, highlight around it, but I could select multiple plugins and I could remove the selected plugins or there's remove all plugins, and that's just from that section. Same with uh, the output section. Um, someone's saying they wish they would get rid of the montage. I, the montage is the only part of WaveLab I use. Um, I don't use the audio editor other than just listening to incoming and outgoing files. Um, for me, the montage is WaveLab, um, but I guess there's more than one way to do your work. Um, but the montage for me is... If they got rid of the montage, I would be not using WaveLab. Um, but what I really wanted to show you is the menu is pretty powerful because you can 
remove some or all plugins. Um, you can copy. Um, this comes in handy for, let's say you're doing an album that was all recorded and mixed at the same time. Uh, once you dial in one song, you can copy the whole chain of plugins and paste it to another clip or all select you could all selected clips so you could um, and I, I have some kind of shortcut for it that I'm not going to remember while I'm trying to talk but you could dial in song two and then you can kind of invert your selection where is it I have shortcuts for this invert the selection and then you could use um, you know you could paste paste the, the plugin chain from song two to all the other ones in, in one command. So it gets really fast to apply all your settings um, from one song to all the others really quickly. Of course, you'd want to revisit those and fine tune them. But if you, if you have a good starting point for one song, you can, you can come up with a cool shortcut. I have one. I just, I, not, I don't have it in my head right now, but basically once song two is dialed in, you could copy that whole clip plugin chain inverse the selection and paste it to the rest of the clips and, and keep going from there. Um, load plugin chain and save. Um, there's these icons here as well. And I have, as you can see, I have shortcuts for them. I just press F for effects chain. I think I've came up with at one point. Um, that brings up the little menu to load your favorite effects chain. So let's say you have a favorite effects chain that you like, you know, you can, of course, save it. They call it a plug-in chain. And once it's saved, you can load it. So that's really handy. Um, you know, I think some of us get in habits. So we know what works. And again, all the none of this stuff is doing anything. You know, the EQ is set flat, but it gets you a nice starting point quickly. So load and save plug-in chain. Um, plug-in map, I've, I've had this... Plugin map is handy just to make sure, um, to, so you know what plugins are inserted or to make sure there are no plugins. If for some reason you don't want any plugins inserted, you can use the plugin map to, to see that. Let me load up a few so you can get a better idea of what the map can look like. But I got a few clips loaded up with plugins and what it tells you is you know, there's two instances of the dangerous um, EQ plugin. They're on clips two and five, and they're on. Uh, now, these are really generically named. If I was doing a real album, they would have some version of like the song title here for you to have a better. It doesn't just. It's not just showing you the clip number. It's actually the name. Uh, I just have generic names here. Um, you can import. Let's say you're kind of dialing in things using master section plugins for some reason. You can import those plugins to a clip or a track or the montage output if you prefer. Um, and bypass, bypass all plugins um, is handy. I mean, there's going to be a level change, but if you want to A-B something drastic, you know, that could work. Or troubleshoot something, it's a handy, handy feature. And then this little setting is kind of hidden, but it's pretty powerful. Um, plug-in window handling. Um, I, I personally like the plug-in chain windows like you've been seeing, um, but this is where you decide that. If you're the type of person that likes one window per plug-in and you kind of have this whole screen full of plug-ins, you can choose this option. Um, and then there's a separate option to close the other ones when you open a new one. I like the plug-in chain window with this, with this setting uh, right here. And again, that just gives you a nice tabbed um, window for all your plugins to see. Uh, it helps. It helps for me. It helps the screen stay a lot cleaner um, and things like that. The other thing I want to touch on is the difference between on and off and bypass. So plugins have um, a number of little things hiding in here, including. You know, stereo operation, mid-side operation. If you only want this plug-in to affect the left channel, the right channel, only the mid, only the side, things like that. There's the channel processing menu. Uh, but what I really wanted to show you here is there is bypass, which correlates with the bypass button in the other view. And then there's also on and off. 
um, bypass. It's still going to use the CPU power that that plugin needs because what, what this offers is more of a seamless comparison. You know, there's no disruption in the audio. On and off actually turns the plugin off, which uh, means that the CPU is not getting taxed. Um, but you're gonna you're not gonna get a seamless bypass because it has to engage, the latency has to adjust. It's 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 a more of a disruption. But you know, watch I'll, gold clips a little more CPU intense. I'll show my transport. Um, actually, it's probably not gonna show because of my screen situation. But um, again, on and off just releases the the CPU tax if if you. Uh, if you need to, for whatever reason, if your computer is getting maxed out, that's kind of the main difference there is the um, between bypass and on and off. People ask that question a lot. What's the difference? Um, and there, it also comes into your rendering. You know, um, if you want to bypass the master section or not when you're rendering. Um, Things like that. Um, the other cool thing I've, I should have talked about a little earlier is plugin. I talked about plugin chain presets, um, where you're loading like a bunch of plugins. But let's say you're not using plugin chain. Let's just say you like a certain plugin. Um, what you can do is, of course, you can save a preset. So whatever you dial in, you can just go to save preset as. And I don't want to update my preset, but I could save that. But the more cool thing, and, and it's actually easier to show you on this. Uh, I like this Vertigo plugin, but the default settings that it comes from Plugin Alliance are terrible for mastering. It sounds like you're trying to get a fuzz bass tone or something. But this is actually a very cool plugin for mastering if you use it subtly. And Plugin Alliance plugins do not to my knowledge, have a default. Some plugins allow you to have a default starting point more globally, like Soothe and Air EQ. Um, to my knowledge, Plugin Alliance does not. Um, never thought to make it bigger. Um, I'm using a different size screen, so everything's a little different for me today. But uh, my whole point was, aside from saving you know, my preset, you know, I load this, you can save a default preset. That means as soon as you open the plugin, it's already set to a certain point because watch what happens when I press zero. I think this is how it comes from the, when you first install it, some kind of insane setting. Um, but watch what happens when I insert it um, again. It's at my preferred starting point. So usually what I do is I find a starting point that I like with plugins I save it as a preset here, but then I also go to um, I also go to this menu and go to default preset, and I and I say save as default preset. You can also remove if if you don't like it, um, but for me, I have a lot, pretty much all the plugins I use regularly. I have a, and I know it's a little bit off the screen. I'm sorry. Um, all the plugins I use regularly, I have a a default preset so that. Um, if I load it individually, it's going to come up in a more sensible um, starting point. Like for me, even the Sontech EQ that just came out, um, I have a few frequency points that I prefer to use it with. And of course, some of the other behind the scenes settings. So again, that allows you to, you can save your own preset that drops down in the menu. But even better, you can uh, even better you can define a default preset so that you don't even have to choose your preset. It's just automatically set to how you like it to start with. So um, I think that is a pretty cool um, feature that was somewhat recently added to WaveLab. Um, and I, I should jump back to the plugin window handling. I showed you the plugin chain window. That's only for the montage. Um, the master section has its own setting for that. So if, if you want to use plugin chain windows in the master section, you have to go to the master section and choose it in that menu. 
And for the master section, I have it turned off because I just really don't use the master section. I, I uh, except for Clarity M. So that is something I should have mentioned. The master section has a separate thing. I did see at least one question a little earlier back. I'll try to answer it. Um, I think the last thing I'm going to show is um, a little bit of plug-in automation for those that haven't checked it out yet or were aware that it's possible. And for a deep dive, you know, check out the video with uh, that focuses on plug-in automation. But um, let's let's do it with this little mock-up single session. Um, of course, we can automate the. This isn't plug-in automation yet, but we can. Of course, I do a lot of um, envelope automation of the. Maybe not in this song. It's pretty good, but um, you can of course feed more level into your plugin chain if the intro is quiet. Um, so again, we have. Well, I'm actually gonna go back to the album mode. Um, so we have um, clip effects, track effects, and output effects. And as I mentioned, you know, you just can't automate plugins in the output or track section yet. You know, maybe in the future that'll be possible, but basically clip effects are where any automation can be done. And to be honest, I don't do a lot of it, so I'm gonna, I may not be super fast at this, but um, there's a section here called automation slash envelope. And if you, Yeah, if you click on it, you get this create clip automation for band two gain and you can add it there. And now you can have your, let me draw a volume envelope so you can see that. That's, that would be just straight gain changing. But if I click on the um, Pro, Q, Pro Q3 band two, now it's showing a straight line again because I haven't done any automation yet. I've done level automation but if we want to automate that band of the plugin, we have to go here and we can just simply draw in some changes. Let's go back to the plugin, see what happens. Uh, I don't have band two active, but you can see as I play the song, it's changing. I'll start it over again. So you can see it's changing. So that's basically how you do your plug-in automation at the clip level and you just kind of have to make sure that anything you want to automate is inserted at the clip level. I, I was never, I wasn't dying for WaveLab to add automation. What I would do is if, if a certain part of a song needed a different setting, I would just kind of chop it up into sections and say this is the second verse, it needs something to happen. Then it would just have, the second verse would have its own clip effects and then it would do its thing. Um, but again, automation, there's a lot of, uh, you, know, you can smooth out the automation. You can turn it off if you want to, um, see if you prefer without the automation, you can turn it off. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do, uh, with plugin automation that, um, again, I did a pretty deep dive into it a few months ago, maybe even longer. Um, probably when it first came to WaveLab, I think 11 was the first one to have uh, plug-in automation. So I probably did one soon after WaveLab 11 came out. Um, but there are some nice things that it shows you, you know, the actual value of the time, and you'll see it um, changing. So that's plug-in automation. I'm going to try to um, see if there's any questions that could be answered. Um, you can, of course, delete the automation... Um, you can get more involved with that. And you can also access the automation possibilities from, from this menu, kind of like you would select a plugin. So I have these three plugins inserted on clip five. Um, with some plugins, it can be a lot to look at. Like Pro Q3 has so much stuff, it has four sub menus. But um, I'm trying to think, it might just be right click, and maybe I was overthinking it. But to get it to, yeah, you just right click on a knob. So if I want to automate um, this band, the gain, I just make sure the knob is visible and I right click and then it's going to create that 
up in the the menu system there so again just watch the actual automation video that'll be better i'll try to see if there's any questions here yeah i'm not going to be able to answer any external um, effects questions i just don't use external effects if i'm going to work analog i make a reference track and i don't have it I definitely don't have it set up today because I'm in a temporary office, but if I want to go analog, I send the audio from a reference track out to my analog chain and record it onto a new track. I just don't use the external effects plugin, but I'm going to guess that it likes to have a little bit of buffer ahead of, ahead of it or before, and then you have to trim it later. It's I think it's asking a lot for WaveLab to have an external effects chain and have it be as clean as, say, like a plugin. But again, it's not something I could give you an answer on with with experience because i just i just don't use that i'll try to read the question again um, you might want to answer you might want to ask that question on the wave lab forum or the users group and we can dive more into it i, I don't have a good answer for you just because i i just don't use that um what's the deal with metric halo i tried to ask them about their hardware I don't know what the deal is with Metric Halo. Um, I've contacted them for various things. I don't have any of their hardware, but um, their partnership with the plugin people that are doing that plugin, I, I was impressed with how quickly they resolved the issue. And I think this is a good sounding plugin. And it, once they fix that little rendering issue, it's been working great in WaveLab. Um, it's kind of been my go to um, EQ plugin lately. Well, I think that's about it. I apologize for the screen size issue. Um, next, Hopefully by the time I do the next live stream, I'll have my normal setup going again um, in the main studio. Today was just a little office setup with a different size screen. Um, thanks everyone for watching. If you do have any questions, um, of course, hit up the Wave Lab users group on Facebook. That's the best way to ask not only me a question, but there's other people that use Wave Lab in different ways than I do. And so there's some windows users. It's a good place to just, you know, it's not just me helping people. It's, it's ever, there's a lot of other people that help out as well. It's a good place to ask your question. There's also the wave lab forum on the Steinberg website where you get good information, um, about things. I wish I could answer that external effects question, but again, I just don't use it, but I would say, um, you know, when I go, even when I go analog, you know, I'm recording it back in, then I'm doing my trimming, and then I do my final renders. I just I just think, you know, trying to do it all in one thing is asking a lot of any program, and you're always going to want to do some trimming of the noise floor and uh, tidying things up. I also don't like to paint myself into a corner with doing it all in one go, because then if, if you have to make an adjustment, um, you have to redo all your analog steps, so... Anyways, getting off track, but um, thanks again for watching. There'll be another live stream later in October. Uh, we'll announce the topic soon. And thanks for using WaveLab. Thanks for watching this live stream and all the other ones. And we'll see you again soon.